and hello, I am Saad from TU Global. I am head of regulatory compliance here and it's a boring name for fun stuff, at least for me. So uh, we take care of PGAs. So let me know that. On. There it is. Okay. Sorry, I had that open to verify whether I went live. YouTube is not my forte. Some tail logistics is. So I'll stick to what I'm good at. Um, I'm giving you guys a couple more minutes to file in before we jump into it. Uh, in the meanwhile, I'll talk about um, introduction to PGAs, why they are needed, and then we'll officially get into the thick of things. I know for many of you, it's quite late in the evening. It's after hours for you guys. So because of that, I'm going to keep it very short and sweet. We'll uh, stick to the topic of introductions. We'll get to see what some of the more common PGAs are and how they can impact our and your shipments. And hopefully within 20, 25, 30 minutes, we'll wrap it up and we'll get talking more afterwards. So um, I think many of you have joined in so we can officially get into it. PGA compliance. Uh, PGA is a word that's probably going to lose its meaning, at least for me by the end of this webinar, because there's going to be so much repetition, but partner government agencies is what the PGA is abbreviation for. Uh, partner government agencies are different agencies that help US Customs in enforcing their compliance for all the shipments that pass through US borders, ports, and the airports. The reason why there is a need for other PGAs and not US Customs is because America imports such a vast variety of commodities and it's humanly impossible for one organization or entity to have manpower that knows about all the compliance pitfalls, the details, the requirements for each and every one of those hundreds of millions of products. So what Customs did was delegate certain commodities according to their type to different agencies under their own umbrella. Currently in the year of the law 2024, there are more than 47 PGAs. Uh, we are only going to look at a few salient ones that we come across most often and have the most impact. Obviously there are more and you can ask about those if they are not part of this and we can have a chat on that separately later on. So um, as we discussed, some of the more common ones are um, USDA, FDA, EPA, and CPSC. So some of you, actually many of you would be familiar with FDA there, uh, but the other three are just as important and have overlapped with FDA a lot more in the recent past. So um, USDA and APHIS are uh, usually synonymous because uh, APHIS is a sub-branch of USDA anyway. So um, that's to do with animal and plants and everything. FDA is Food and Drug Administration. We all know and love. Uh, EPA is Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and then there is Consumer Product Safety Commission. This is an interesting one. Uh, we'll get to know how in just a little bit. So we'll start off with uh, USDA. Um, USDA and APHIS uh, regulate the commodities that are based on animal and plant products. So consider your uh, seeds, your um, wood and lumber, even furniture, because it's made of wood, um, your organic products, meat, live animals, even trophies. So say, you know, you are going to Africa for hunting or if you have a permit and you want to bring that trophy back as a souvenir, USDA is going to be interested in that. So um, there are other arms of USDA as well, fisheries and wildlife, um, your leather and hide stuff but um, that's not as common. So USDA is what we come across most commonly uh, because there's a lot of 
pulses and rice and seeds being imported into the U.S. from China as well. Uh, we see a lot of seeds, so uh, USDA is interested in looking at them and to ensure that they are compliant. Those products are not bringing any diseases that are not native to U.S. continent, so uh, North American continent. So that there are certain commodities that do not jump out as USDA regulated straight away, but they are, uh, such as organic products. This is also an interesting one because in the past, organic requirements weren't as strict. But in the last few months, they have ramped up their scrutiny and want certifications for organic products as well. So consider your organic honeys or organic beauty products, shampoos, even if you are importing towels and it says organic next to it, you need a certificate. It's just an example. So um, as you can see in the slide there, Lacey Act uh, is something that's very common for people who are bringing in furniture to US. There's a lot of furniture coming in from China, bedroom furniture, you know, um, drawing room furniture. And uh, there's one other uh, PGA that's involved in that will come in a little later, but Lacey Act is super important and it's a requirement. And if you don't have it, chances are your product is not going to pass through the port. So the next one uh, is EPA. So we were just talking about furniture. So it's a, a nice little segue here. Uh, EPA is the agency that regulates the commodities that impact environment. So consider your chemicals, your pesticides, your body sprays, HFCs, air conditioning products, all that stuff. So anything that has impact on the environment around it or could have adverse uh, effects, EPA is going to want to look at it and ensure that it's up to accepted levels or none at all, the impact I'm talking about. So uh, in the past, um, we saw EPA get heavily involved when we were bringing COVID-related products, so your disinfectants, your surface wipes, all that stuff, that a lot of those shipments had to go back because EPA was not too happy with the compliances in them. So um, remember the interested, uh, interesting agency you were talking about, which is CPSC. It is Consumer Product Safety Commission. So um, it, you can see the academic definition on the slide there, but uh, if we talk in layman's terms, it's the agency that regulates all the products and assesses the potential of any uh, damage or adverse impact to US public. So the prominent things that they look at are IP right violations, um, if it's to do with children, so toys, uh, baby garments, stuff, and even uh, the products that are used, so strollers, bicycles, all that stuff, that's EPA's bag, or even um, your mattresses. So what they want from you when you're importing a CPSC regulated product is uh, reports. If you have done testing on the set product, if you have uh, compliant labels on the product, anything that can help them with traceability. And Consumer Product Safety Commission can, uh, has the potential to hit you when you don't expect it because it's not very apparent that they regulate a product unless you're importing toys. But other products, you would believe or think that it's not regulated by them. And when it comes to US port, and it's already with US Customs, you realize CPSC is not only involved, but they're asking you for something that you don't have and you can't get because you had to get that before exporting it. So that's uh, why we put heavy emphasis on it as CPSC has ramped up their scrutiny and they are heavily investigating more shipments that pass through these borders every day. In our experience, um, in a couple years ago, it was like one shipment a day, if that, that was uh, being regulated by CPSC or was investigated by them. Today, if you ask my team, um, brilliant guys, by the way, 
they come across 15, 20, 30 shipments per day that CPSC has some sort of hold on and is asking for different documents. So we need to be very careful if we are importing any products into US and if you guys are exporting here. So be wary, be careful and ask us or any of the informed people before exporting it out, whether or not you need to satisfy more requirements than you think. Next up, we have the FDA. Many of you are here for just this reason, I know. So FDA, it's in the name Food and Drug Administration, but it's a very deceiving name. It's not just food and drugs. It has more things up its sleeve. So uh, it regulates, as it says, food, drug, but also cosmetics, medical devices, and radiation emitting products. The last one is a curveball because many people don't realize even your LED bulbs are regulated by the FDA. Trust me, I didn't understand it either initially, but after I read more into it, it made perfect sense. But yeah, so that is something that people don't realize often. Um, a lot of these have their different sets of requirements. So that is why we are get, going to get a bit more uh, deep into FDA in today's webinar. We'll discuss uh, some of the branches that FDA has and how they can impact your shipments and what you need to do for them. So um, the examples we have already discussed, food, drug, medical devices, food contact substances even, so like kitchenware, and decoration pieces. Um, for food, you need uh, different requirements. Um, next thing is humans and veterinary drugs. Uh, also a branch of FDA. For this, you need a facility registration as well, just like you do with food, but it's a separate one. That's a very easy mistake to make. In our experience in the past, people have come to us thinking that they were registered with the FDA, trying to import drugs and getting stopped at port. The reason was they were registered as a food facility, not a drug facility, which caused a lot of problems for them. So um, drugs is a very sensitive subject. It can have life altering, and in some cases life ending consequences for people. So it's understandable why FDA would want to put heavy emphasis on compliance. It's a long and tedious procedure to get a drug approved for human consumption here in the US. It can take years even. So um, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get your product approved. Uh, first up, you have to get yourself registered as an FDA drug facility, then you have to have your NDC codes, a lot of stuff. So um, I'm not going into too much of the stuff that's written on the slide there, because you can read it and it's self-explanatory. Drugs are here to cure disease or prevent disease or for treatment of it. Um, another arm of FDA uh, is, that is also very sensitive is medical devices. Medical devices, are also very sensitive because they are often used in uh, life critical or life saving situations. So these are tools or instruments that are being used to treat or cure or mitigate any disease. Um, these are broken down into levels. So there are three levels, level one, two, three. Uh, it's an increasing order of sensitivity. That means is level three is the most sensitive product or tools. Consider your um, life-saving tools like pacemakers or uh, artificial implants or um, that kind of stuff that is affixed to your body more or less permanently or has a use that without which your body could not function properly. So it has the highest level of sensitivity you have to uh, put in more effort and investment and time to prove to FDA that your level three product is good enough to be sold in the US. Next up is level two. So it's a uh, halfway house between level one and three, medium sensitivity. So consider your 
um, surgical stuff, your scalpels, your bone saws, your surgical gloves, or your surgical gowns. These are all um, level two devices. So slightly less requirements, uh, number of requirements as compared to level three, but still a hefty amount. Level one is, I would like to call it your day-to-day -day stuff, uh, medical stuff, competitive day-to-day -day medical stuff. So like your masks and um, hospital patient gowns and uh, you know thermometers and that kind of thing. So these are comparatively uh, easy to um, be approved, but um, you still have to know what you're doing before you get an approval with the FDA. As with everything else we discussed earlier, you have to have a different FDA registration for these as well. So if you're registered as a drug facility or a food facility, that's not going to help you. For medical devices, you need to have a medical device registration, and so does your importer. Next up, we have cosmetics. This is a fun one uh, because cosmetics used to be a relatively easier arm of the FDA in the past. Uh, the main reason for that was that you didn't have to be registered with the FDA as a facility like the other three. So uh, you could just import into US uh, or export to US uh, without any problems as long as you were following good manufacturing practices and your labels were compliant. But um, in the next four days, that's going to change. So from July 1st, because of the Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act of 2022, that's right there on the slide, uh, that part has changed. Now you have to have a mandatory registration with the FDA if you are manufacturing cosmetics. And I know cosmetics are a big deal for you guys. Uh, a lot of cosmetics are being imported here from China and the surrounding regions, Vietnam and all that. So you guys would be the ones most impacted by it. And I am hoping many of you have gone through your registrations already, but if you haven't, please do, because you only have four more days before FDA decides to enforce FDA registration. So what that means is if you are not registered at the time of import and your product isn't listed with FDA, they are not going to let it pass. You either have to destroy it or send it back to the origin, which is no bueno. Um, we understand that it's a lot of waste of effort, time, and money for you guys and it hurts the most when we see that happen. So it's our topmost goal to ensure that that does not happen. So we are here to help you out, and I'd recommend talking to us or any of the informed people about this cosmetics registration, because it's a relatively new thing. Not many people are aware of it. Even people who have been importing for years and years in the past, they are just as new at it as someone who decided to export to US yesterday, because this rule is very new and very, very impactful to everyone across the board. So I once again, I implore you to look at your registrations, make sure they're in order and all your cosmetics products are listed. One more thing to note with cosmetics is that there's a very fine line between a cosmetic and a drug there are certain products that can be both at the same time. And if that's the case, then you would have to satisfy both the cosmetic FDA registration requirements and drug requirements. So the compliances for both need to be met. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, these products uh, tend to catch people out very often. So say you're exporting toothpaste to US. Uh, US. It's normally a cosmetic, but if it has fluoride in it or it's anti-cavity, it's also going to be a drug. Another example is shampoo. We all know it's a cosmetic. We import them day in, day out as a cosmetic. But if the shampoo says it's anti-dandruff or anti-hair fall, that's going to bring it to the realm of a drug as well. So that shampoo is going to be drug as well as uh, as cosmetic. So requirements for both need to be met. So 
recommend talking to us or someone informed about your product before you decide to export or sell to US, just so you can get your compliance requirements aligned before it's too late. That's what we are here for, just to make things easy and as smooth as possible so there are no problems down the line. Um, next thing, we have generalized the requirement for all the commodities that are being imported and are regulated by the FDA. So the document requirements, I know a lot of you have these questions. Actually, that's the first question we hear anytime we receive a query that, hey, I have so-and-so product, what are the documents required for it? So these uh, are the generic requirements you have, always have to have these documents, and depending on your product, maybe more case-to-case -case basis specific. So your commercial invoice, the packing list, uh, FDA credentials. Packing list is an interesting one, again, because we know packing list is uh, provided with every shipment, regardless of whether it's PGA regulated or not. But it becomes even more important in case of the FDA is because unlike other PGAs, FDA does not stop you from picking up your shipment from port or the airport. So they can, uh, they let you pick it up and take it to your own warehouse. Just, they are better like that. They are lenient so you don't have to pay additional storage charges or demurrage or detention and all that stuff. But the downside is that you have to have a very accurate record of what the commodity is and how it's packed. The reason behind that is if FDA wants to inspect your cargo, they are going to travel to you, to your warehouse to look at it. And the way for them to compare whether the cargo remained intact or not is the packing list. So the packing list needs to uh, be descriptive, detailed, as detailed as possible. More detailed is good in this case. So it make, makes FDA's job easier at the time of inspecting your cargo. FDA credentials, as we discussed, so you have to have all, for all four branches of FDA, you have to have separate credentials. If we have them, we need to file the entry with those credentials as a part of it. If we don't, the entry is going to be rejected. Uh, talking about uh, taking it to your warehouse, a uh, very important thing to remember is that it needs to be near the vicinity of the port that it arrived at. Uh, the reason behind that is uh, FDA is going to travel to you. And if they deem it too far for them, they are going to ask their brick brother, the US Customs, to bring it back to the port. So that's going to end up costing you more money in terms of trucking it back to port, having additional delays because of the trucking, going back, exam, and then bringing it back to your warehouse again. So a safe number is a 50 miles radius around the port. Uh, this is uh, based on our experience. It's not as strict, but 50 is a safe number. As long as it's within that radius, FDA doesn't have any problems coming out to you and inspecting. Um, that's also the reason that we ask our clients to ensure that the uh, cargo remains intact and the goods aren't distributed until there is a release from FDA. One more important requirement uh, for any shipment that's coming to US uh, borders is a custom spawn. So custom spawn is a legal contract between a surety and US customs and the importer guaranteeing that the importer is going to comply with all the compliance requirements. More importantly, they can pay the penalties if they don't. So um, this is done through a licensed US customs broker like us. Um, there are two types of bonds, a single entry bond or a continuous bond. Uh, we recommend a continuous bond for PGA regulated shipments for a reason. Because a single entry bond value is determined based on the invoice value of your commodity and the estimated duties on top of that. But if there is PGA involved, 
the invoice value has to be multiplied by three. So the costs end up being three times more for the single entry bond compared to a non-PGA shipment. So continuous bond is a flat fee. It's valid for a year. You can bring in as many shipments during that time as you want. And it's, uh, there is no uh, potential for increased costs down the line in most cases. So we recommend a continuous bond um, as in many cases that I have noticed, continuous bond was cheaper than the single entry bond. So that is another thing to note. Um, I know we have spent uh, a lot of time on PGA, although it was uh, restricted to just introductions. And I hope you are well equipped to make informed decisions before deciding to export to US according to your commodities. And we are here to help you out uh, in making those decisions. So I recommend asking for opinion specifically related to your product uh, when you are uh, looking at prospect buyers in US or thinking of exporting to US, just so you don't have any problems or hiccups down the line at the time of import. Um, I'd like to say the least amount of headache possible for you is the best kind of day for me. And we have a whole brilliant team here that can help you out in deciding what to send to US and how to do so in the most smooth manner possible. So we'll take care of your compliance requirements and uh, inform you of what kind of compliances that you guys do need to meet. I have been Saad Rafiq. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. For some of you, it's your family time even. I understand that because it's evening or late at night. It's just unfortunately the thing is with time zones. So um, if you have any questions, any queries, concerns, I know a lot of you have specific products that you're itching to get information about. Uh, drop us a line at pga at tuinc.com. Um, this email is, address is uh, mentioned in the description as well. Uh, myself and the team would be looking forward to get back to you on your queries as soon as possible and help you make it easy for that product that you have to come inside the US and being sold without problems. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and 